This week on the Marketplace of Ideas, I talked to sound curator, writer, and composer David Toop, author of Sinister Resonance, The Mediumship of the Listener. the marketplace of ideas i'm colin marshall david toop is a composer a curator of sound and the author of the rap attack books ocean of sound exotica haunted weather and now sinister resonance the mediumship of the listener david welcome to the program thank you very much the idea of doing a book about the sound of silent artworks as this one is it, it served you well it's made an interesting book it's made a book that i've enjoyed reading and presumably have enjoyed writing, but there is a certain core absurdity to that idea that I'm sure is not lost upon you. Is is that an advantage as well, that this, the sheer sort of, the, the, the humor, in a sense, of writing a book about the sound of things that are without sound? Yeah, it's a kind of crazy idea, I think. And I was very conscious of it, particularly when I felt I was moving into areas that an art historian is... is is really qualified to uh, to deal with, um, and I thought, why hasn't this been written about? And of course, one of the reasons it hasn't been written about before is because it doesn't exist. It's purely <laughs> speculative. For example, I, I write a lot about uh, sound in seventeenth-century Dutch genre painting, the way acts of listening are represented. Now, I hope I've made a convincing case. So I was very conscious that um, these speculations, these certainly based on on uh, research and and intensive looking, but in the end there is no you can't hear the paintings. You know you can listen uh, as intently as you like, and there's no sound actually there. So it's it's partly dependent on the development of an idea for sure. How much could I say, or how accurate? How accurately could I say that the book is based on specifically your perceptions after 40 years of intense listening? This is specifically about what David Toop hears in artwork. It's certainly very personal. I mean, I think one other aspect of the book is is the idea of sound as, as being very uncanny. And I write a lot about, for example sound in ghost stories and supernatural fiction, you know, writers like Edgar Allan Poe and Charles Dickens. That for me connects with deep childhood experience. For example, one of my first memories of sound is of being, is of lying in bed, uh, feeling very frightened, hearing a sound. I didn't know what the source was. And just lying in bed as still as I could, as quietly as I could, and believing I could hear somebody walking around my bed in the dark. Now, what I was hearing, you know, would have been the normal sound that houses make in the night, the creakings and groanings and all the rest of the, the, the staple of horror films and ghost stories. But, <laughs> you know, this had a very profound effect on me as a child. It, it stayed with me. And, you know, I've come to the point now where I've, I'm asking myself, um, why is this so powerful, this idea of uh, sounds that can't be connected with their source, for example? Why is it so useful to filmmakers, uh, to uh, people writing th these kind of stories? And you come to the idea that sound, it, because it's so intangible, because it's so transient, it's something that we can't grasp, we can't see. So it always has this property of being unstable in some way, elusive, uh, it, it, it's uncanny. And that to me is fascinating. And, and of course, yes, it's, it's the David Toop perspective on things because it, it goes right back to this time when I was a child and, and having this very personal experience. But at the same time, I don't think that that makes it an experience that's so personal that other people can't relate to it, you know. I mean, this this phenomenon of 
you know, things that go, go bump in the night and creaking noises and, and the fear of the unknown as heard through sounds is, is extremely common. I mean, I, I was watching a film last night with my wife, Paranormal Activity, which was on the television. Uh, we'd seen it before at the cinema. And I thought one of the striking things about this film is that there's nothing frightening in it except for sound. <laughs> I mean, you see absolutely nothing. You see nothing. Nothing terrifying really happens. Um, I mean, uh, towards the end of the film, a few small things like, you know, bedclothes being dragged off the bed and so on. But mostly what you're hearing is strange sounds, knockings and so on. And the film, well, I mean, uh, some people find this film really frightening. So I think it's a good illustration of how powerful this this is, this this notion that sound is is somehow threatening, you know, it is somehow strange and uncanny. I forget who said this, but someone once said that in film you 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 shoot things with the camera to show the audience how they look, but you do the sound design to show the audience how things feel. Is that a line you've heard before? Uh, not exactly in that form, but something very much like it. And I, th- I think there's a lot of truth in it. Sound, because of this intangible property it has, has strong connections for us with, uh, with memory, with loss, and it connects very deeply with our, our feeling level you know, our emotional level. And, um, of course, it has all these other properties that can be structured in ways which are very sophisticated, mathematical even. Uh, It has an intellectual component. It has a very strong physical presence. But it does connect deeply with the emotional side of ourselves. So, yes, if you took the sound away from, I mean, if you took the sound away from a film like Paranormal Activity and just left the voice track and the images, it would it would be unbearable to watch. <laughs> you would lose patience with it in about uh, 10, 15 minutes. You know, it's just because you have this idea that something is making a sound, you can't see what it is, and that raises all kinds of fears. And one of the things I do in the book is, is talk about eavesdropping, Eavesdropping is something I guess we all do, you know, either wanting to or not wanting to. But when you think about it, eavesdropping is is common to us all because that's our experience before we're born. You know, we're there in the womb, uh, we're unable to see anything, but we can hear sounds. We don't know what they are. Um, we hear these muffled sounds, or maybe more accurately, we hear and feel simultaneously these muffled sounds from outside, but we have no experience of the world. So the beginning of perception of engaging with the world comes from a form of eavesdropping. It's very powerful. With the whole phenomenon of eavesdropping, as you see it in the non-sonic arts, in the book, of course, you talk about, you mentioned earlier, the 17th century Dutch genre painting. You see some paintings of eavesdroppers. Was this the catalyst for you to cohere these ideas together in the book, or was it something else? Yeah, definitely the eavesdropper painting um, was a catalyst. I, At that point, um, and this was a few years ago now, I, ha- I had a lot of disparate ideas. I certainly knew I wanted to write a book about perception and and listening uh, ways of ways of hearing i didn't quite know how to bring everything together there were too many diverse elements um, and i went to the wallace collection a, a museum in london and i saw this painting the eavesdropper by nicholas maas a dutch painter who was a pupil of rembrandt i thought that's extraordinary because What it shows is somebody listening. It shows a woman, and she's listening. She's standing in the center of a house, poised one foot, about to descend on a staircase. And she's listening to the maid and and a soldier in the house uh, kissing uh, in the downstairs room of the house. And 
She can't see what's happening, but she's looking at you, the observer who's looking at the painting. Her finger is on her lips as if to say, shush, be quiet, you know, let's enjoy this moment together. And it's it's funny, you know, because it's it stretches across this the centuries, this complicity between you and the person in the center of the painting, both eavesdropping on this this scene. And of course, if you look at the painting, you're drawn into this whole story. Um he painted six of these paintings, as, as I discovered as when I started to research it, and uh, four of them, fortunately, are in London. And they're all, they're all like different scenes from a film or a play. Um, they all show similar incidents of eavesdropping, and they're all concerned with the same theme uh, of somebody listening from within a painting. I mean, it's, it's unavoidable, and it, it, it's funny when you start to look at art historians describing these paintings, because quite often they say, oh, the finger to the lips is pointing, as if everything can be reduced to looking. But it's very clear that what she, this woman is saying is, shush, be quiet. <laughs> and so <laughs> there you have it, you know, that the silent, the silent medium is no longer silent. You're, you're in a world of sound. And I found this fascinating. I mean, in one sense, you could say, well, it's looking forward, you know, it's, it's predicting the future of the movies or, or whatever, or, or it's a kind of sound recording. You know, obviously sound recording didn't exist for us until the late 19th century. Uh, but people must have thought before then, well, how can I preserve this sound? You know, you had the, the means to preserve... Uh, memories through writing. You had to, uh, the means to preserve, obviously, material, culture, objects, and so on. How can I preserve sound? They must have thought about this. And what became evident to me was that certain painters were very interested in this idea, and others were simply not interested at all. You can test it for yourself. You know, you go around a, a museum, um, particularly of pre 20th century painters, and ask yourself which of these painters enjoyed listening and which of them didn't and what i found was it becomes very clear very quickly that, that certain painters there's nothing in the paintings that, in, <laughs> that indicates any sound at all and then others they're full of they're full of sound you can virtually hear them you can they're almost like a notation or a, a score for for a, a musical composition it's fantastic before you saw the eavesdropper paintings then how much, when you would experience the purely visual arts, how much were you thinking about their sonic aspect before that? I can easily imagine that, of course, considering how much of your life you've, you've devoted to the, the reception, the production, the, the listening to sound, you, you, your mind would go to a sonic place anyway. But how much pre-eavesdropper paintings were you thinking in this vein? Mm, well, it's funny you should say that because I actually trained as a visual artist. Uh, I mean, I played music in bands when I was a teenager, but uh, my idea was that I would become a visual artist of some kind, a painter, I don't know. Or I went to art school, and then I eventually dropped out of art school and became a musician. And over the years, my desire to visit art galleries and look at art diminished. And I think at a certain point, I felt, I really wanted to re-engage. I was, I was going to galleries and I was, I was thinking, I don't know how this works. You know, how does it work to go to a gallery and look at paintings or look at artworks? How do you do it? <laughs> it's kind of a, <laughs> a strange disconnect, you know, that, that you stand there for, for two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, or you just walk quickly around. And, you know, you know it's a weird thing. If you spent your whole life going to music concerts where, you know, it's fairly clear to you how you relate to, to music or sound work. You know, you're sitting in a chair or you're dancing or you're standing or something, but you know how it works. And I had this strange disconnect and I thought, well, this is ridiculous. I, I don't know how to look anymore properly. I felt my senses were completely out of balance. Everything was so focused on listening. That was part of the whole process, I think, that I started going to museums and galleries again and looking at paintings. 
And it was only then, through this process, that I came across this this painting, The Eavesdropper, which gave me the gift, I suppose you could say, of this, this revelation. And after that, of course, I started listening to everything I looked at. It was a great new discovery. But I certainly couldn't claim that in previous years I'd really been listening to paintings in the same way. Certainly I've been aware, I've been conscious of connections. You know, I mean, there's, there's a very famous connection between the artists in New York and, uh, and the composers, John Cage, Robert Rauschenberg, Morton Feldman, Philip Guston, you know, a very tight relationship between them and an influence that went both ways, the composers influencing the painters and the painters influencing the composers. But that's more, that came more, I think, from a, you know, like a knowledge of um, 20th century arts rather than this kind of almost tangible sensation of being able to hear, hear paintings. And then the challenge, of course, was to extend that into the 20th century when you move away from representation. So you can look at a painter like Francis Bacon, for example, and a lot of his paintings sound is central to them. You have these screaming figures, and it's absolutely fundamental to the impact of those paintings. But then as you move into abstraction, it becomes more difficult. And um, that's where the latter part of the book really concentrates, you know, trying to find, for example, this idea of the void, you know, or silence, examining silence, for example. A lot of people have uh, made a comparison between certain abstract paintings, particularly monochrome paintings, and the idea of silence. But I was thinking, well, if you have a monochrome painting that's completely black, and if you ha- and then you have a monochrome painting that's completely white, are they both silent? Because <laughs> <laughs> in a sense, they're both opposites, aren't they? So you know, plenty of plenty of food there for for re-examining these ideas and 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 trying to draw out what the connections actually are. When you originally left the visual arts, put them aside for sound and music, how much of it was this durational aspect, the fact that music is set in time in a certain way that made music and sound more appealing to you? Or was it something else primarily that made you make the switch? I think the durational aspect was part of it, but I I don't imagine I... Um, I understood it in that way at the time. To be honest, I, it's difficult for me to say, but I know that I was at art school and um, I started playing music with people and at a basic level I found it more exciting. Um, it felt more dynamic to me. Um, it, it's some deep part of myself was addressed by by working with sound and playing music. And, of course... Um, the analytical side, the, the writing side, has, has been uh, has has run in parallel with that. You know, has been equally important. But music has always been necessary to me as as something that touches me very deeply. I guess working with uh, the visual, yeah, I I somehow lost interest in this 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 aspect of seeing the world. You know, we have this thing in our society that um, reality is 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 imagined through seeing and touching. You know, we say we have all these phrases like "seeing is believing." So, in that sense, um, sound and music is has an air of unreality about it. It's insubstantial, and and some people would use that word in a derogatory sense. You know, that that it it has no solidity, it has no reality. It's a bit like when you're growing up and your father says to you, be realistic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't make a living with this stuff. And, you know, that's that's our view. That's our social view of, of, of you know, that music is important to us, but sound in itself isn't sufficient to describe reality. And... I guess at some point in my life I felt that for me it was sufficient. 
which is not to say that seeing and touching and all the rest of it became completely unimportant to me but maybe in some ways it's it's partly redressing the balance that that things get out of balance uh, uh, our sensory engagement with the world um, can get out of balance, and and so you have to work. You have to you have to work on developing, you know what's what's been lost to some extent. And certainly for years, that's what I did, and and I still do with listening. You know, I mean, I still I still spend a lot of time, you know, really listening hard to to whatever's around me. You know, this. Uh, Maybe you came across it in the book, you know, but some some inspiration came from just taking the dog for a walk and and <laughs> <laughs> yes. you, you know walking through the woods, local woods, and and just um, using that opportunity, using that opportunity to to really listen to to the environment and uh, you know analyze what's going on. As I said before, that's something I'd I'd forgotten how to do with looking, but I do think that. Uh, you know, listening touches a core part of myself, and and maybe when I was uh, nineteen, which was when this break happened, when I moved from visual arts into into music, then I had a realization that you know that was more important to me. How much of this this ephemeral, transient quality of sound, the fact that you're never going to again hear whatever sounds you happen to be hearing, whatever mixture of sounds you happen to be hearing at any one time again, how much of that is directly appealing to you? Or how much of sound, how much of the appeal of sound to you can be explained by the fact that you like this sort of, this this one timiness of, of so much of sound? Well, I think it's it's not just me. I mean, it, I, th- I think it's why we value music so highly. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter whether it's a recording or a live performance. It doesn't matter whether the performance, once it's over, will be lost forever or whether you can, you know, listen to it immediately again or, or listen immediately to what you just listened to, <laughs> um, you know, which is something that's, that's now possible with MP3s. You know, you can listen again to what happened three seconds ago. It doesn't alter the fact that it's always disappearing in time. I think we value that in the same way that we value the seasons and the weather. And uh, in, for example, in in Japanese gardening, there's a there's a strong focus on the passing of the seasons and and the sense of of loss that that gives you and and that pain of feeling, for example, that. Even as you experience springtime, it's disappearing. It's highly pleasurable and is is very much part of the way we make sense of the future and the way we make sense of, of the past and the way we engage with the present. It's It's as if when you listen to music, when you listen to sound, you just have that split second in which to do so. And then it's gone, and then obviously you're on to the next split second. It's a, I mean, it's that makes it sound mechanical, but which it's not. It's a, it's a seamless flow. The sense of something passing by has an intensity to it, and and I think that's one of the reasons that music can become so locked into people's memories, their passions, their you know their their sense of identity, their their emotional engagement with the world um, in a way that other forms of art, you know, other forms of art, we, we, ha- we have a slightly different relationship to them. I mean, for example, nostalgia is, is a very big thing with music, isn't it? You know, that, that people get fixed on a, on a certain period of their life when they're listening to a certain kind of music or, um, the sense of pleasure that people gain from bird song that they know that bird song is is very transient it's it's otherworldly in a sense and and it it gives a deep pleasure to listen to it so you know it's it's the sense of something always passing that is is i mean as as human beings we're we're conscious of our own mortality aren't we we're conscious of a, of our given span Music, in a sense, is a, is a metaphor for that. Uh, and uh, it doesn't matter how joyful it is, 
it's always going to end. So <laughs> it's a it's a kind of uh, sweet and sour feeling, let's say. You know, the, the, the pleasure and pain simultaneously, and that's that's what gives it its piquancy. In writing the new book, Sinister Resonance, was it, or how much of a guiding principle was it then to find the work of non-sonic artists, of writers, of painters, of all that, of artists who truly understood the transience of sound and seemed to have seemed to have an eye toward expressing that transience or evoking the transient transience or ghostliness i mean was that was that in your mind as the type of artist you wanted to think and write about here or did it just kind of end up that way well i I think i went into it with an open mind you know i i I had some ideas you know because i i do have some background in art history and um, i mean I, i read a lot so um ideas had let's say, built up over the years. But I really went into it with an open mind. And, and for example, you mentioned the writers I, I talk about. Um, I, I started to read as much as I could of supernatural fiction. You know, a lot of the time, you, you can find a writer, um, Algernon Blackwood, for example, fantastic descriptions of sound. Sound is constantly important in his stories. Um, and so clearly it was very important to him. He was very sensitive to it, and he realized it was a very useful device for, for conveying certain feelings of dread or, or fear, mysterious feelings, very atmospheric feelings. Um, Edgar Allan Poe is, is another great example. I mean, Poe, I think, was the first serious writer I read when I was a child. And <laughs> you can say it almost scarred me in a way. <laughs> Reading stories like the Telltale Heart made a huge impact on me when I was a child. And, it, you know, something I returned to over and over again over the years. And this was the first opportunity for me to really analyze those stories, you know, to ask myself, well, how was he using sound? Why is it important in the stories? What's it, what's it doing in the stories? And of course you make discoveries, you know, you go into these things with a fairly open mind and you make discoveries, you know, those are wonderful. Uh, certainly in terms of the paintings, I mean, it's it's had a very big effect on me. I, I travel quite a lot and every time I travel now, if there's a museum in the city I'm going to, then I head for the museum and it's a great thing, you know, it's 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 like it's a privilege in a sense that you're being paid to go and do your work and, and, and travel and experience this this city, this foreign city, but you also have the opportunity to go and see these wonderful artworks. So it's been a very enriching experience, I must say, writing this book. I want to get an idea of what I imagine as being the feedback loop between you writing this book, which prompts you to then look and listen at things that may be relevant to the book, which then you, of course, bring it back to the book, and then that changes the book. Now, is it... First of all, I should ask, how much of the, how much of the material, how much of the, the art were you already aware of when beginning the book, and how much did you discover in the process of getting into the world of this book, of the mindset of this book, and then going to explore while you were in the writing process? Well, seeing the eavesdropper painting by Nicholas Maas was a kind of epiphany. It, it something clicked in my mind, and, and I thought, well, this is this is fantastic. This is this is a new way of experiencing this work. Of course, from that point, I, I was going everywhere, <laughs> sort of experimenting with, uh, you know, I go to the National Gallery in London, or the um, the Art Museum in Dublin, or the Louvre in Paris, or wherever, and and I would go around and ask myself. What can I hear in these paintings? It's very interesting. You know, it's, it's just a new way to appreciate these works. It doesn't cancel out all the other ways that exist. To take the example of 17th century Dutch genre painting, this is a style of painting that has been extensively analyzed by art historians. It's, I mean, it's so full of symbolism. It's so full of innovation in terms of perspective it's so revealing of of social structures of the way people lived the domestic environments the 
you know, the, the social life of the streets and the architecture and so on and so on and so on. They're so rich, these paintings, that, you know, when you look at the bibliography, it's vast. Now, you look at the big bibliography for books about sound in general, it's very small. So you think, well, there's a lot of work to do here. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's very exciting. That's, that's very, very exciting. And you asked me about a feedback loop. Well, yes, definitely. There's a, there was a very strong feedback loop going on. And uh, in a way, I was trying to be cautious, you know, because on the one hand, I was very conscious of moving into territory, which was not my own you know, moving into um, literary analysis and art history and so on, which is quite a dangerous thing to do. And I, I've tried to write the book so that I'm never pretending to be what I'm not. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm never, I'm sa what I'm saying, I hope, is that I'm a specialist in sound. I'm a specialist in music and listening. I'm not a specialist in these other areas, but as an outsider, I think I've spotted something. I think I've, I've come across something that is maybe worthy of more research, more study. It's, it's, it's perhaps it's interesting enough for somebody else to come in and, you know, give other views on it. And that sense of having made a discovery was uh, very stimulating for me. So... Yes, there was uh, a sense of searching, searching material out and then finding new things within the material. And, uh, I mean, these things become obsessive after a while. <laughs> I mean, you, you, there came a point where I was, everything I was reading, for example, I was, I was just putting post-it notes in, in every page that had an interesting reference to sound. And... There comes a point where you think, where will this ever end? You know, will I ever be able to read a book again, you know, free of this, this peculiar perspective? And, of course, in one sense, you, you're not. I mean, I just, I just finished a, a really interesting book uh, by a S Scottish writer, John Buchan. It's got some great passages in there which are very sensitive to sound. And I suppose my feeling was that uh, because we are a visiocentric culture, uh, because we tend to value uh, seeing and touching more than we value listening, this is a it's a kind of undervalued aspect of our culture. You know that there it is; it exists. It's plain to see, but it's um, barely recognised. And so, in a sense, my work here is to expose it, you know, just, just to say, well, here it is, you know, and this is, this is my view of it. And then, of course, you, you know, your, your book comes out and you hope that somebody else <laughs> finds it <laughs> of some interest or, or value or, or actually finds it credible in some way. You know, that, that remains to be seen. If you've just tuned in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas. I'm Colin Marshall. My guest right now is David Toop, sound curator, writer, composer, and author most recently of Sinister Resonance, the mediumship of the listener. You can hear this interview again or any other in the Marketplace of Ideas history at colinmarshallradio.com, our official website where there is a complete archive. You might enjoy the other conversations I've had about matters sound-related, including that with Travis Elbro, author of The Vinyl Countdown, A History of the Long Playing of Vinyl Album, and with Lawrence English, the Australian sound artist. That's colinmarshallradio.com. Do check there as well for show notes to accompany this interview, linking to information about every person, place, and thing we mention here. If you have any feedback, positive, negative, neutral, or otherwise, don't hesitate. Send that along to Colin, C-O-L-I-N, at colinmarshallradio.com. That's Colin at colinmarshallradio.com. Now, back to the conversation with David Toop. I want to get an idea of the approach you've taken to the challenges such a book poses formally. And with, with three of your past books, Exotica and Haunted Weather and Ocean of Sound, they're books I've read and enjoyed, and a lot of people who have written about them have said, 
you use a um, a very subjective style, a very eclectic style, uh, a lot of unusual connections you make. Some say stream of consciousness. I think that's a little bit unfair, but um, how? To what extent have you followed the followed the lead of those books with this new one? As far as the form and the, the techniques you use to uh, to string everything together. There were two extremes at work on me in this new book um, that were in some, to some degree in opposition. One of them is the fact that for the last 10 years I've had a position in academia and it's, it's not a teaching position, it's as a research fellow. So, you know, I, I have a great deal of freedom, but at the same time, for the first time in my life, since I dropped out of art school, I'm within an educational institution. And of course that began to have an effect on me. You know, I was being invited to speak at academic conferences and uh, to, <laughs> to some extent feeling the, the weight of my the catastrophe, let's say, of my own education, <laughs> having to deal with that. And of course I was, uh, I was beginning to supervise uh, postgraduate students and um, reading more and more, let's, let's say, scholarly literature. And this had a big impact on my writing, and I would say a crisis even at, at a certain point. Um, I suddenly didn't know how to write anymore, and it, it took me a few years at the beginning, uh, you know, at the point where I was beginning to write this book to really resolve that problem. Uh, what kind of style do I use? Do I completely reject my past style, which is... Uh, as you say, it has some aspects of stream of consciousness. It's, uh, you know, I worked as a music journalist for 10 years, so obviously that has been an influence on me. How do I resolve that? You know, can I, do I abandon that style of writing completely and work in a completely scholarly way, you know, according to all the conventions of, of academia? Or do I continue and... Uh, you know, ignore all that. And that was a very difficult problem to resolve for me. You know, I would say it took me a couple of years and, and some of the period in which I was actually writing this book, I really struggled with it a lot. I mean, I hope that I've come to a resolution and I don't know what you think about it, but I think it has some sense of, it's the previous style of the three books you've mentioned, but maybe it's it's more careful in certain areas. Um, it's less uh, uh, what's the word? It's it's less kind of cavalier about, <laughs> <laughs> about uh, some of the more philosophical assertions or arguments. Let's say on the other pole to this, partly I was writing about the modernists. You know, the key modernist writers, James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, T.S. Eliot, to some extent, Faulkner, Samuel Beckett, because all of these writers um, wrote in extraordinary ways about sound. You know, you could argue that James Joyce's last book, Finnegan's Wake, was completely about sound. He described it as music, just music. Uh, Virginia Woolf was her books were full of passages which anticipate John Cage by many years, you know, passages about listening and the effects of effect, effects of sound. Faulkner, extraordinary, you know, a book like The Sound and the Fury. It's an auditory book. You know, you, you hear it as this extraordinary outpouring of conversation, inner thoughts, sound. These writers who um, were instrumental in the technique of, of what we call stream of consciousness were very much on my mind as I wrote the book, and, and to some extent influential. I mean, I think certainly there are passages where, you know, James Joyce is coming through very strongly, Samuel Beckett's coming through very strongly, particularly at the end of the book, you know, which is examining Joyce's short story, The Dead, from Dubliners, and then it ends with this image of Samuel Samuel Beckett walking through art galleries, you know, and hearing the sound of his own boots, 
this became very real to me. This this technique of writing, um, this this way of, in a sense, honouring more closely the way we think, or even the way we dream. In the case of Finnegan's <laughs> Finnegan's Wake, I won't pretend that it wasn't a conflict. You know, on the one hand, the urge towards um, academic respectability, <laughs> <laughs> and on on the other hand. Uh, drawn towards the extremes of high modernism. And, <laughs> well, I leave it to you to, you know, come to a conclusion about your feelings about whether it works or not. But it, it certainly for me, it was a fascinating struggle, you know, because I am interested in writing as I'm, I'm not just a kind of person who's obsessed by music and who just kind of cranks it out you know i'm interested in the process of writing the practice practice of writing and um so it's very important to me the 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 reader's relationship to the books it's not just facts and information and the new book sinister resonance it does it does feel different to me than your previous books although i can't put my finger on it though of course in many ways it feels similar to them nobody would mistake it for someone else's book certainly and it's interesting you mention your your relatively new academic position because I've always thought of you and your work in terms of the sound you've made or the sound you've curated or the books you've written as the work of a non-academic and in a very good way because I do think a lot about the position of the academic. They can write for academics, in which case the audience is quite limited and often the, the work itself is not particularly accessible or they can write for a wider audience. But the problem of academics writing for a wider audience or, or making music for a, writer, a wider audience in the case of a musical academic is that their next meal is not coming from that project. And thus, <laughs> and thus I don't know if you know what I mean, but it's, I do. The, stakes are, the stakes are different and not necessarily in a good way. Now, how important is it to you to, to, keep, to keep the not an academic feel to, to the work you've had. We touched on that in the previous question, but I, first, is, is this something you even considered a part of your identity as not being an academic? Of course, now you, you have a position there, but is that something you've thought about yourself? Well, I was never given the opportunity to be an academic uh. until 10 years ago. And I did feel, you know, very, even though I was interested in scholarly work, you know, I read, I've read a lot of anthropology over the years, um, you know, I've, I've, I've certainly done a lot of research in these areas, but I was never part of an institution, let's say. And I felt very conscious of that. Maybe I would say I even had a chip on my shoulder about it because I had a very difficult experience myself with education as a teenager. Coming to terms with that was, was quite difficult. And I must say I, was, I had a degree of prejudice. Um, I mean, I freely admit that. You know, sometimes prejudice, well, a lot of the time prejudice comes from a lack of understanding. As I've spent time within academic institutions and um, worked with people who have a much more scholarly approach, I begin to appreciate it much more and, and understand it more clearly. So you develop sympathy. But at the same time, I think if I have a value, then to some extent, it's as something of an outsider. You know, the, the value of the outsider is that they can come up with these, um, these new ideas, you know, like this, you know, this crazy idea of being able to hear paintings, for example. <laughs> I, I did try to talk to a couple of art historians about it, but they more or less ignored my emails. <laughs> and, and I think what they feel is, oh, this is too risky for us, you know, it's too shaky, it's, we can't get involved with this. And I, I respect that, I understand that, because they have a position which is dependent upon fulfilling certain rules of the academy. And um, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm much more of a freelance kind of person. Being a freelance kind of person means you live with a certain kind of insecurity, but it means you do have the advantage of being able to say what you want to say, and you just put it out there, and other people judge it. You know, that's that's what happens. Now, 
I've always felt that I wanted my books to be available in bookshops, not just in university libraries and so on. Uh, that's been very important to me. And, and the feedback I've had from, say, a, a book like Ocean of Sound, I mean, I still get feedback. I, I was just, I opened up my Facebook page two days ago and somebody had posted something on my page and they said, oh, I'm just reading Ocean of the Sound for the third time. And, uh, you know, I think, well, that's great. You know, it's, it's fantastic. That's a book that came out in 1995. And people are still drawing something from it. And, and people say to me, oh, well, that book, you know, I just came across it by accident. Now, that's probably the difference, isn't it? You know, that books like mine you could come across by accident, whereas um, more academic books, which are much more expensive, much harder to find, it's very unlikely that you'll come across them by accident. You have to probably go through a research program and then eventually... Uh, you'll come across them, but my books you can you can just walk into a bookstore and pick them up, and uh, you know they have attractive covers, which is another thing. It's always important to me to get somebody to do an attractive cover and and pick them up, leaf through, leaf through it, and maybe it's something you've you've never considered before. Maybe you're a person who doesn't like experimental music, for example. What one of the things I think I do is to make links. Sometimes those links are unexpected, but they do connect you from, they can connect you maybe from something you know to something you don't know. My feeling is that in our society, that there has tended to be very strong, a very strong compartmentalization of different experiences, different cultural forms, uh, different genres and uh, different you know, it can be, we can talk in a very broad sense and say art is separate from science, for example, or body is very separate from the mind, or we can talk in very specific sense and say that one certain form of dance music is very separate from one other very distinct form of heavy metal, <laughs> say, <laughs> you know. And I don't really buy those compartmentalizations i understand why they exist how they've come into being and why they're convenient but it's not the way i think it's not the way i experience the world it's not the way i believe things should be what i hope for my books is that somebody could pick one up and they find you know for example if they're looking at ocean of sound they find a chapter about craft work and they think, oh, I like craft work, you know, because I like techno music. And then they're reading about Sun Ra, you know, and they never listen, listen to any jazz in their life. Equally with this book, I think, you know, somebody could say, well, I'm interested in ghost stories. I, you know, I love Charles Dickens or whatever. And the next thing they know, they're deep into listening to the sound of leaves underfoot. Or <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's, yes. It's being able to make that jump, being able to make that leap, and and suddenly you're in an area you don't know anything about, but you're not you're not so totally uncomfortable or lost um, that you can't cope with it. Which I think is what happens in a lot of academic books. You know that they're so specialist, uh, necessarily so. I have to say they're so specialist that. If you don't know about the subject, then you're really lost. You know, you feel you need to go back 10 steps to, to have a greater understanding. And there's a certain amount of snobbishness as well, isn't there, in, in all kinds of uh, areas. You know, classical music is a prime example, but it's not just classical music. It's, you know, dance music culture can be very snobbish. You know, hip-hop can be very snobbish. <laughs> you know, if you, if you don't know about this, you're nobody kind of thing. And... That's not what my books are about. They're about moving flu more fluidly, let's say, between all these uh, different areas of expression. Yes, classical and hip-hop and electronic dance music are three areas of music where the genre walls, or I should say the sub-genre walls, stand quite high indeed, and uh, they, they're often triple reinforced. But in, in life, I was... 
Were these genre boundaries something you had to deprogram out of your own brain, or did you just never acquire them, and that's why that's maybe why you've taken the path you have? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I certainly went in for a certain amount of deprogramming uh, in my late teenage and early 20s. I very deliberately began to listen to forms of music or forms of sound, let's say, that had a very different structure very different things going on in them to what I was familiar with, what I'd grown up with. But I must say, if I go back further than that, and and this is something that maybe comes through in a book like Exotica, I grew up in the 1950s, so rock and roll was part of that, obviously, and that had a huge impact on me. But also it wasn't such a a very fine demographic tuning <laughs> that goes on these days didn't exist then. And um, so if you listen to the radio in the 1950s, you would hear such a bizarre cross-section of music. <laughs> you know? I mean, particularly in, in this country, living in, in, in England. Um, so you'd hear strange sort of Latin music and uh, country music and uh uh, sort of light classical music and bits of rock and roll and everything was mixed up together. I think for some people that was a terrible thing, you know, and as soon as they became a teenager, they separated out and they'd say, well, I just listen to soul music or I just listen to rock music or I just listen to pop music or I just listen to classical music before... 1990, uh, sorry, uh, 1890 or whatever. <laughs> and I think I took this experience of this, um, this strange mix, haphazard, almost random mix of, of musics, and that was the way I listened. I mean, that's not to say that I didn't have very strong tastes. I did. And, uh, you know, when I was a teenager, when I was a young teenager, um, I identified with certain kinds of music, but I think I was always lo- looking for what's beyond what you're given. So, for example, when I was a young teenager, you know, I started listening to the Rolling Stones when their first single came out, and almost immediately I thought, where does this music come from? What's the original? What's that, what does that sound like? And I went to the original, uh, which happened to be by Chuck Berry, sung by Chuck Berry, and I thought, actually, I think this is better. <laughs> this is more interesting. <laughs> so that process was very rapid for me, that everything I listened to that was produced here, I could go to a source, and I found the uh, the originals more interesting. Uh, of course, once you start on that path, then you know, you're constantly looking for what's beyond. Uh, so in that sense, yeah, I developed a, a form of, quite open listening early, early on. And um, once you've got that, then you don't really lose it. You're fairly open to anything that you find interesting. I had a strange experience a few years ago. I had a, a kind of a brainstorm. I decided to do this opera writing course as a student. And opera was maybe the one music in the world that I couldn't stand and I, I knew nothing about it, you know, and I didn't want to know anything about it. I'd never been to the opera. Everything I heard of opera, I didn't like. Uh, but for some weird reason, I, I decided I wanted to do this opera writing course. And, well, things really happened after that. You know, I, I was awarded a fellowship to, to compose an opera, and uh, uh, that's what I did. And I've become much more open to opera, but I realize that we have certain areas that we dislike because we we don't feel a part of it. You know, this is this is where racial divisions or class divisions or, or whatever or education comes in. And then we have certain other areas um, of music that we reject through prejudice. And I would say in my case, opera was was one of these uh, examples. Uh, we have a certain areas of music maybe we don't understand, and then we have other areas of music which are 
either tuned or not tuned to who we are as a human being, you know, and, and that accounts for taste, I suppose. Our preferences, that you can be as open as you like and you still have preferences. And then you have critical faculties. You know, you, you say, well, I like the idea of, uh, I don't know, black metal or something. <laughs> but when I listen to it, most of it sounds really terrible, badly made. And, and, and so I like these examples, but I don't like these examples. And so you have that, you know, that necessary critical discrimination. You know, it's not all great. It's not all terrible. You know, you begin to develop a kind of discernment within that. Um, it's very, very important. You know, staying open is very important. And I, th I, th I think as you get older, I mean, I'm 61 now, you know, and, and I can really feel the, the pressure to not stay open. You know what I mean? It's, it's like it becomes more important to uh, expose yourself to, to maybe what you don't like or what you don't understand. Otherwise, there's a kind of ossification, you know, it's just part of that natural process of, of human aging, you know, and, and, you know, there's a the sensation that you can get tired, <laughs> you know, of always listening to new stuff. So, you know, that's, that's something you have to work harder at, but it's still possible to do it, I think. And if you have that foundation of open listening, then... It doesn't matter if it's, you know, the, the new thing, the next big thing. You, you kind of understand what's going on in it. And then sometimes something comes along, you think, oh, I don't understand that at all. What's going on here? And what you've heard is probably a great piece of music or a, a real breakthrough, you know. And that's a fantastic moment when it, you just don't get it, you know. <laughs> It's just an openness, I think. That's how I would describe it. The name of the book, once again, is Sinister Resonance, The Mediumship of the Listener. David Toop, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the program. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. It's great. If you'd like more information about David Toop and his work, visit davidtoop.com. This has been the Marketplace of Ideas. I've been Colin Marshall. You can hear this show again or any other we've ever recorded at colinmarshallradio.com where there is a complete archive or search for the Marketplace of Ideas on iTunes. As well, there's show notes linking to information about every person, place, or work we mentioned in this conversation on the website, colinmarshallradio.com. Once again, the website of the man who makes our theme music, Ben Althaus, is available at benalthaus.com. If you have any questions, comments, feedback, guest suggestions, or anything whatsoever to let me know, well, do it. Send it to Colin at ColinMarshallRadio.com. That is C-O-L-I-N at ColinMarshallRadio.com. Once again, thank you for listening. We'll catch you next time. <laughs>